Okay, let's start. Okay, so uh, I would like to talk about the calculation of something that is called the EHZ capacity of polytopes. And everything I'm talking about today is joint work with uh, Daniel Rudolph from Ruhr University in Bochum. And yeah, that's working, okay. So first of all, let's have a look at the to-do list of my talk. Um, well, since we are computing something that's called the EHZ capacity, I should explain what that is. And in order to do so, I will give a brief introduction to symplectic geometry and I will also provide a little bit of motivation of this whole topic. And afterwards, I want to take, uh, talk about the computational aspects. And in that part, I will talk about the quadratic assignment problem really quickly and show how this relates to our problem setting and about co-positivity and completely positive optimization. And that's going to be the punchline of my talk. So first of all, what is symplectic geometry? Uh, in symplectic geometry, you consider the Euclidean space, which should have even dimension, r to the power 2n. And we equip the space with an anti-symmetric bilinear form. You can see that one here. See immediately that it's anti-symmetric because this matrix J that defines the bilinear form is anti-symmetric. Uh, keep this matrix J in mind, it's going to come up a couple of times during this talk. And uh, this bilinear, bilinear form is referred to as the uh, symplectic form, or more precisely the standard symplectic form. Uh, and this provides the Euclidean space with some sort of uh, structure that we would like to consider in symplectic geometry. And in particular, we might ask what transformations preserve these um, symplectic form and this structure. And this motivates the definition of a symplectic map. You can see it down here. A map phi that is continuously differentiable is uh, uh, symplectic if it leaves the symplectic form invariant, which means that if we apply the Jacobian of phi at any point x to both arguments of the symplectic form, then this doesn't change anything. So we might ask now, um, what do we know about symplectic maps? How do symplectic maps look like? And we do not know much about this, actually. It's only essentially two things. First, there's a rather old and well-known result that the volume doesn't change if we uh, apply symplectic maps. So volume of phi a is equal to volume of a if phi is a symplectic map. And a much more recent and new result is called Kromov's non-squeezing theorem. And not to state this, I would like to draw your attention to the bottom of the slide here, where I define an infinitely long cylinder. So since we are in r to the power 2n, we might write our uh, vectors in this uh, fashion here, x comma y, where both x and y are n-dimensional vectors. And now I require that the first entry of each of these vectors together lie in a disk of radius big R. And everything else can be whatever it wants to be. So basically, you can think of this as a disk that extends up and down infinitely. Kind of. We are not really in three dimensions. We are in even dimensions, but you get the idea. So um, that's what I refer to as an infinitely long cylinder. And now Kromov's theorem states that there is a symplectic injective map that maps the Euclidean ball of radius small r to this infinitely long cylinder with radius big R, if and only if small r is less or equal big R. So we can think of it that way. Um, if you have a ball and you map it into such an infinitely long cylinder, and you're only uh, allowed to apply symplectic maps to do so, then this is only possible if the ball fits in into the cylinder in the first place without any deformation. So in a sense, you might say that symplectic maps do not squeeze balls together, hence the name non-squeezing theorem. Um, this theorem has an incredibly easy proof. And I want to show this proof, but first we need a definition. And the definition is the symplectic capacity, so it's kind of the central object of my talk. And the symplectic capacity maps to each subset of r to the power 2n, a non-negative number or infinity, such that the following three properties hold. First, we have the monotonicity property, in the sense that if we have a set A and a set B, 
and the set A maps to B with a symplectic injective map, then the uh, symplectic capacity of A should be lesser or equal than the symplectic capacity of B. Then we have the two homogeneity property, which means you can take scalars out if we square them. And last but not least, we have the non-triviality uh, property, which means that both the uh, Euclidean ball with radius one and the infinitely long cylinder with radius one should have symplectic capacity pi. And now the proof is pretty easy. Um, first, I go back to the statement real quick. First, we assume that R is less or equal than big R. And we have to show that there's a symplectic injective map phi that maps from B smaller to Z big R. But that is easy, just the identity map does the trick. So it's pretty easy to see from the definition that the identity map is really a symplectic and injective map. So uh, that is pretty easy. Conversely, uh, we assume that there's a symplectic capacity C. And then the proof is completed with a simple calculation. We have pi r squared is equal to r squared capacity of b one zero because of the non-triviality property. Then we can use the two homogeneity to take in the r squared, and we get the capacity of the Euclidean ball with radius r. And then we use the assumption that there's an symplectic injective map that maps br to zr. So by the monotonicity property, we can say that this capacity here is less or equal than this capacity. And then we apply the same steps backwards. We apply the two homogeneity and we apply non-triviality for the cylinder. We divide by pi, we take square roots and we are done. We have small r is less or equal than big R. Excuse so, me. Yeah. But the question is here, why does uh, this symplectic capacity exist? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, that's so simple because you don't know uh, whether the symplectic capacities really exist. Um, the good news, they do exist. <laughs> um, actually, Gromov uh, gave an example himself right after he came up um, with this proof. That's actually why he came up with this proof in the first place, of course, because he had a symplectic capacity in mind. But since then, many other different constructions have been found. Uh, for instance, the ekeland hofer capacity and the hofer zehner capacity, which, uh, as has been shown by Künstler in 1919, uh, the same capacity as long as you talk about uh, convex sets. So this gives rise to the definition of an ekeland hofer zehner capacity that somehow makes sense. Um, before I get to the definition of the EHZ capacity, some bad news. So far, it seems like uh, symplectic capacities in general are very different to compute, uh, very difficult to compute. But what I mean is that um, there's not been much attention to computing them actually. It was more or less uh, viewed as a theoretical object so far. Um, but since people try to compute them, they found that their approaches uh, break down very early. And it seems that at least they look like very different problems to compute. You will see what I mean when I get to the definition a little bit later. Um, but first, maybe you're scratching your heads a little bit because uh, this sounds very technical, everything, and why are we uh, interested in synthetic capacity in the first place? Why should we equip R to the power 2n with some anti semantic bilinear form? I want to give you a very short uh, intuition why this is a good thing to do. And for this, I would like to do a short excursion into Hamiltonian mechanics, which is a branch from physics, some of the branch where this whole topic originated from. And in Hamiltonian mechanics, we want to know how a particle is moving. So particle sounds pretty small, but can really be just any physical object that moves uh, in a physical system. So for instance, if you're studying the movement, movement of a planet, that would also be considered a particle in physical terms. And such a particle is given by the position and by the momentum. This is why we are interested in even dimensional Euclidean spaces, because you always have position and momentum in pairs. And now uh, there's an equation that's due to Hamilton that gives us a uh, yeah, differential equation with which we can compute the movement of such a particle. And here's a function h coming up. It's not really important what that is at this point. It's just a differentiable function um, that reflects what physical system you're talking about. Go ask your favorite physicists what the reasonable Hamiltonian is for your problem. Um, for us, it's just some function, it's differentiable. 
An alternative way to write this in a little bit more neater manner is this one here, where the matrix J is coming up again. We call that this is the anti-symmetric bilinear form that we had earlier in this talk. And uh, now if you draw the corresponding vector field to this differential equation, then it turns out that every flow in this uh, vector field is a symplectic map. So essentially, if you are wondering how such particles can move, then you're really just uh, studying symplectic maps. Okay, so let's get to the definition of the ekland hofer zehner capacity, where definition is a little bit of a stretch. It's not really the definition. I rather show you a convenient reformulation because this is really everything I want to talk about here. So I think that's good enough if we assume that's the definition. Um, the reformulation, by the way, is due to Abundandolo and Meyer. And uh, it states that if C is compact and convex and contains zero in its interior, then we can give the eklan hofer capacity by this uh, equality here. We have one divided by four eklan hofer capacity is equal to this maximization problem where we try to maximize uh, the objective function, which is called the action functional. You can see it down here. And the optimization variable that is uh, a Lipschitz continuous curve that is parameterized by zero and one. The curve should be closed, which means x0 is equal to x1. And the derivative of, the, um, of this closed curve almost everywhere should be a member of the polar set of C. So um, that's a pretty big space where we are looking for a solution. And that's why it's pretty difficult to do. But, excuse me? Yeah. Can you elaborate a bit about the geomet physics, I don't know, geometric sense of uh, of, of the definition of capacity. So it's somehow we uh, count uh, the action of, of the movement along the circles, yes, inside the body. Uh, not inside the body, not inside the body. Polar sets. Um, I yes. Agree with inside the polar set. Um, let me say uh, in the actual definition, I think it's a little bit better to see this is more or less the jewel of the. Um, of, of the actual definition. Mm. I think it's a little bit tricky to see the uh, uh, connection between the uh, ekland hofer zehner capacity or the, the whole stuff we had before and uh, the geometric interpretation of this problem here. Um, yeah, I, I'm not really sure how to answer this question actually. Uh, Shall we maybe move on and talk about this yeah, later? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I just asked if, if, if there are any a nice explanation. Um, I'm at least I'm not aware of a immediate nice explanation to this problem. Um, I, maybe we talk about this uh, after the talk. That's maybe a good idea. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can use this definition not only for for smooth bodies, yes, uh, because I know the other definition of second uh, position capacity. Or that use uh, characteristics of the body. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's uh, I think the real definition of that, where you have the minimization problem and you look for a minimal characteristic, and this is somewhat the dual, as I said. So, um, and for this duality to work, you need uh, uh, actually no. Um, there, there is a version of this theorem that uses non-smooth boundary. Um, for, for technical reasons, I would like uh, to say it in this way here, but it does work for, uh, for other uh, sets as well. And in, in two slides, I'm going to talk about polytopes. So yes, you don't need smooth boundary here. Okay, so uh, anyway, uh, an idea to make this set of solutions a little bit more manageable is to discretize, discretize this problem. And with that, I mean that we partition the interval zero to one into smaller subintervals. And for each of these subintervals, we just pick some element of the polar set of C. And then we assume that X is piecewise linear, which means that on the J subinterval, we just want the derivative of X to be VJ. And then there's a result by Heim Kislev from 2017, so fairly recently, that states that uh, if C is a polytope, then this discretization is exact. So really the maximization is still equal to the 
uh, one divided by four times Eklandhofer Zehner capacity. And not only that, but it's enough in two here to look for permutations of the vertices of the polar set of C. So in particular, we can let K be uh, the vertex number of uh, C polar. And if we plug this in into our problem, problem takes this form here. Um, first of all, you see that there are um, two optimization variables. The first optimization variable is the permutation sigma. The se second optimization variable is a vector y, where each entry is non-negative. And these y's basically take the role of the length of the subintervals. So tj minus tj minus 1 essentially is yj. So maybe I explain real quick that the um, first constraint here that models the fact that uh, we require our curve to be closed. And the second constraint here that models, models the fact that these intervals are really just sub-intervals of 0 to 1. So the whole curve is still parameterized by 0, 1. And if you look at this problem, that is reminiscent of the quadratic assignment problem because you are looking for optimal permutation here. So let me give a really glance at that. In a quadratic assignment problem, uh, the idea is that you are given n facilities and n locations, and you want to build each facility at a location where, well, each location should have exactly one facility, and one facility goes at exactly one location. Makes sense. And you want to do this in a way that you minimize the cost. So what is the cost of, uh, of such an assignment? And first of all, we have between each two facilities a flow, which you can think of like uh, the amount of goods that you have to ship between facility I and facility J. And then you have also the uh, distances between each pair of locations. And you have the cost to build a facility at some given location. And now you want to minimize the cost in a way that you minimize first the sum of the building costs. And this cost here that you can think of as the cost that is uh, due to the shipments that you're making. So if you um, bid the ice facility at location sigma i and the j's facility at the location sigma j, then um, you multiply the flow between these two facilities with a distance to get a um, somewhat measure of the cost for shipping from facility I to facility J. So um, this is the quadratic assignment problem. And quadratic assignment problems are very difficult. What I mean is they are NP-complete. And not only are they NP-complete, but also approximating within a constant factor implies that P equals NP. Um, in practice, these problems start to become challenging uh, at N greater or equal than 20. and um, considered widely to be uh, impossible right now if n is bigger than 30 in general, as long as you don't have some uh, particularly easy special cases. OK, so um, if you have a look at our problem from this point of view, um, I put the problem here again. Uh, then we can observe that we actually have a quadratic assignment problem because we can just uh, substitute the, the yj's with some set zjs, we get this problem here. Now we moved the uh, optimization variable sigma out of the constraints. It's only in the uh, objective uh, function now. And now if there's some magic oracle that tells us what the optimal choice for z is, then what remains is a quadratic assignment problem. So just the uh, objective func function here was given z, that is a quadratic assignment problem. Um, I just want to show you that because that is a way to uh, think about this problem and a way to tackle this problem. Um, we did try this a little bit to, uh, uh, let's say we didn't get very far with that. Uh, and I want to uh, talk more about a very different way to look at this problem. So um, solving this quadratic assignment uh, problem issue, that is future research. and so, we try to ship around this problem by just removing the optimization over the permutations completely and solve the remaining problem here for every single permutation sigma. These become very, uh, the, the number of problems that you have to solve become very big very quickly, so we have to stick with small k. But then again, as I said, quadratic assignment problem is uh, a difficult problem to look at. 
So uh, thinking about serving this for, for large instances is not very reasonable at that point, I think. Uh, so but we might ask, okay, we removed the sigma. Is this problem easy now? Did we get rid of the um, difficult part? And the answer is no, it is still difficult because this is non-convex quadratic optimization and that is known to be NP-hard in general. So the um, objective function here, that is uh, neither convex nor z concave. And the way to deal with this problem is given by Buhrer, who stated that uh, any problem in this form, so non-convex quadratic optimization problem, can be formulated as a, a completely positive prob problem. So I put it in this form here. Um, these uh, inner products that are here, that's the trace inner product. And the matrices that are coming up, uh, I put here for the sake of completeness. They're not really important for the talk right now. Um, it's just suitable matrices that ensure that this problem is equal to the quadratic problem uh, we had in the previous slide. The uh, interesting part is now that we um, have an optimization variable that is a completely positive matrix. And the completely positive uh, matrices, I put the definition uh, under here, that is a cone, and the cone is uh, given by the convex hull of the rank one positive semi-definite matrices that Z transpose, uh, where we require that Z is a non-negative vector. So if we remove this non-negativity um, requirements here, then this is just the set of positive semi-definite matrices. If we put this equality in, that is uh, a subset of the positive semi-definite matrices. And more precisely, it's a subset of the set of positive matrices intersected with the matrices who have non-negative entries, because you see immediately that every matrix you can write in this manner here has only non-negative entries. Um, by the way, this uh, subset, that's actually an equality sign if we have k less or equal than four, I believe. I believe it was four. And so the equality is, and the equality of the subset is strict if uh, k is bigger than four. Okay, but the nice part now is uh, where we move the um, difficulty from the objective function into the cone constraint. But as we, let me get back really quick. As I said here, we have a somewhat more manage manageable cone that uh, contains this set of co-positive matrices. And this means that we can perform a relaxation. So we take the same problem but we remove the co-positivity constraint and instead we require that the matrix X is positive semi-definite and has only non-negative uh, non entries. And now that's SDP and that we can solve. And I would like to show you the results that we uh, got. So in the first column here, I have the dimension of the polytope C. Um, I would like to point out that this is not what makes the problem big because um, let me go back real quick. You see that the problem size that is given by K, which was the number of uh, vertices of the polar set. So this K here, that determines the problem size essentially. And the upper bounds we came up with, I put in the third column. In the fourth column, I can only provide exact solutions if we have the dimension equal to two, because in dimension two, we, uh, indeed know what the ekland hofer zehner capacity is. It is just the area of uh, our uh, polygon. And if you have a look at this, these upper bounds look pretty tight. So there are a few instances like here where it doesn't look as tight. It's maybe the, um, uh, uh, it's the, the difference of order 10 to the power of minus three. But in all other, diff uh, in all other not all other cases, but in most other cases, uh, it looks like this might be the optimal solution up to solver accuracy. And I think I have even enough time to move on. Yes, I have. So I um, would like to elaborate a little bit more on to this and maybe how to show that uh, this upper bound is exact or when this upper bound is exact. And yeah, you have uh, more than 15 minutes, right? but so you have time. Nice. I was a little bit... Uh, very that I'll, I'm, I'm short on time. Okay, cool. So as it turns out, indeed, the upper bound is equal to the 
exact value one divided by four equal to five standard capacity if uh, our set um, if our polytope is a simplex, i.e., if the number of vertices of the polar set is two n plus one. And I want to show you the proof for this. So um, if we assume that X is feasible for the semi-definite program, then we have, of course, that X is positive semi-definite, which means by the spectral theorem that we can write it in this way here as a um, linear combination of rank one positive semi-definite matrices, where all the UIs are the eigenvectors of X, so they are linearly independent. And the lambda i's are the eigenvalues, so they are non-negative. And additionally, we have the first constraints. Maybe I go back real quick. This constraint here. That says that some matrix A sigma in a product with x is equal to zero. And now the definition of A sigma is more relevant. I put it here. So you can see that's the Gramian matrix of the vertices of the polar sets. So since the Zagramian matrix is uh, A sigma is positive semi-definite, and because uh, C is a full dimensional polytope, it's also not difficult to show that this matrix has full rank. And with that, if we put in this formula for X, we get uh, that this sum here is equal to zero. And now we note UI transpose A sigma UI is non-negative because A sigma is a positive semi-definite matrix. The lambda I are non-negative. So if the whole sum is equal to zero, every summand has to be zero. And this means that in every summand, either lambda I is equal to zero or this term here has to be zero. And then it's also not difficult to show that if A sigma is a positive semi-definite matrix and you require that this term here is equal zero, then this is only possible if UI lies in the kernel of A sigma. So for every i, we either have uh, that the ith eigenvalue is zero or that the corresponding eigenvector lies in the kernel of A sigma. But now we can apply the rank nullity theorem to show that the kernel of A sigma is equal to one. And here we use that A sigma has full rank. So um, there's really only one ui at most that can be in the kernel of A sigma. So this means uh, there's at most one lambda i that is uh, not equal to zero. So the rank of x is at most one, and we can write x in this manner here. And now we knew, use the fact that x should be component-wise non-negative. And this implies that the u is either positive or negative, right? Because the, um, the signs cancel out, and you can't have positive or negative signs. Um, but you might as well just assume that u is positive because even as u is negative, as I said, the, the signs cancel out. So it's safe to assume u is positive. Um, but this means now that x is a copositive matrix, right? Because as we call copositive matrices, you can write in this way where uh, u should be a non negative vector, and that's exactly what we have here. So uh, our feasible matrix X is actually copositive and thus also feasible for the copositive program. And together, we now find that uh, if we not only uh, require that as a, as a, a feasible uh, solution for the SDP, but we might also assume that uh, X is an optimal solution for the SDP, then again, we get that it's feasible for the co um, completely positive program. So the optimal value of the completely positive program, that should be at least as much as the optimal value of the semi-definite program. But as we elaborated further, um, the, uh, the SCP is a relaxation of the CP. So we also have that the optimal value of the CP is lesser equal than the optimal value of the SDP. So we actually have equality. And since we know that the completely positive programs equal, uh, that the, the, the maximal, solution that the maximum value of the completely positive program is equal to one divided by four times the eclan capacity, the same must be true for the semi-definite program. So in this case, we really don't, do not have an upper bound. We have the um, exact value that gets returned by the SDP. So what do we do if C is not a simplex? In these cases, we can basically try to recover this approach. Um, Basically, the idea starts from here. 
defines an optimal solution that has rank one, and then the whole machinery here goes back through again, and we can show that the SDP and the CP return the same value. So the task is now to find an optimal solution of the SDP with a small rank. And to do that, uh, it's a good idea to look at the nuclear norm, which is defined by um, the sum of all the singular values of x. That's the general definition. Since we are only dealing with positive semi-definite matrices here, we might also remove singular values and put in their eigenvalues. It's the same in our case. And this turns out to be a good heuristic uh, for the rank. And the nice part about this nuclear norm is that uh, there's uh, a representation as a semi-definite program that is due to Recht, Fasel, and Parillo. Uh, I put it right here. So if we take this problem here and we add the constraints that the matrix X is an optimal solution of our SDP, for which we have to solve the SDP first, of course, in order to um, find the, the optimal value. Uh, then we have uh, a way to compute an optimal solution with presumably small rank, meaning well, it's, it's a heuristic. We don't have any guarantee that it has the minimal rank, but uh, it, it uh, turns out to be a very, very reasonable approach. And if we do this, we actually get the um, rank one here everywhere where this uh, upper bound seems to be very, very close to the exact solution. So this provides us with a way to actually prove that our upper bound is equal to the exact solutions. And only in these cases here, where we can see from our eye that this is probably uh, not the exact solution, we cannot just reduce this to solve accuracy, there we get uh, a rank, a minimal rank that is not equal to one. So of course we don't have a proof here that uh, that's the optimal solution that doesn't look like the optimal solution anyway. And um, most excitingly, we can also do this in higher dimension. So if we do not have an uh, exact solution, because we do not know what the eklat hofer capacity is, which is why we do all this in the first place, uh, in, in this cases, we also have a way to prove that we actually found the eklat hofer capacity, which is pretty cool, I think. OK, so I think that concludes my talk. Yes, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm open for questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any question, please? Yeah, I have several questions, actually. Yep. So, uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. It was very nice. And uh, I mean, everything was quite clear. And it's quite a difficult topic, actually, to understand. And uh, my question is the following. There is an open conjecture that the capacities, uh, for example, uh, this one, uh, positive uh, semi-additive, yes? Mm -hmm. And I guess that it recently was proved that if you uh, partition a convex body with a hyperplane, then you have this semi-additivity. And using uh, these, uh, for polytopes, using this, how they how to say, representation of, of the optim uh, optimization problem, using its property, can you prove something like uh, semi-additivity of capacity for some special cases? For example, if you consider, I don't know, yao yao partition of a body or whatever, or just at one point inside and then somehow construct some polytopes. Mm. So I, I, I mean that it, for sure there, there are some symmetries in this optimization problem, uh, as probably for some specific bodies, and then using them to prove something like semi additivity uh, or whatever. Mm. You can probably do that by. Uh... Okay, I mean, an easy approach would be to uh, yeah, uh, to just hope that you uh, get these rank ones. So you take your uh, um, favorite set, you partition it, and then you just uh, run our algorithm and hope that you always get rank one. And then you can just compare the numbers. But um, I don't know how to uh, adjust this approach to find that um, you have uh, the, the sub-additivity. I, I know that people are looking into this, but uh, to be honest, I haven't looked into this part too much. 
But for for example, if you add some new constraint, can you think in this like this? So I want to add some new constraint and increase uh, the capacity. Ah, it, it might be seen in this way as well. Yeah, so I see what you I, mean. Yeah, you you have a system of uh, like uh, some inequalities, and then you say, okay, if I this geometric uh, transformation of my body operation, whatever. And uh, that it uh, must increase the or decrease capacity. Mm -hmm. So from from the algebraic point of view, or yeah, algebraic point of view, just of the properties of your system of inequalities, can you conclude something like this? I mean, it, it's for me, it's very interesting. Yeah, it's, it sounds really interesting. I I think that might actually work. Um, actually, I think I should <laughs> write this down and uh, and try this a little bit. Um, I mean, I, I, I cannot uh, f foresee now how it's going to turn out, but I think that might be possible, yes. Thank you. More questions? Comments? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for your presentation. Thank you for listening. And all. Yeah, uh, and now...